today. Our sermon this morning is going to be the final in a five-part presentation we've been doing on prayer. That doesn't mean it'll be the last sermon you hear on prayer, but just this series talking about the priorities of prayer. And today in particular, we're talking about prayer and healing. Now, I'm going to tell you in advance what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about what the Bible says about prayer and healing. And then when we sing our closing song at the end of the service, there may be some of you here that have some special need for a particular healing, or you may want to come. And uh, in behalf of someone else, we're going to invite you to come forward. We're going to close our service today with a special prayer that God will heal. Um, you know, I, I remember meeting a man years ago that said, I've never been sick a day in my life. And that's probably not true of most of us. Of course, he's dead now. But uh, most of us would say at some point we've been sick. Some of us may feel sick now. And sickness is a, a big problem in the world. Um, one of the main reasons Jesus came is to heal. You can read in Acts chapter 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, Jesus was filled with the Spirit. One principal part of his ministry, he went about doing good and healing. But he says, healing all who are oppressed by the devil. So when we talk about healing today, we're not just talking about healing from uh, physical illness. Uh, we need all kinds of healing. We need healing in our homes. We need healing in our minds. Need healing in our, maybe our families, our land. And uh, all of this is encompassed in what we're discussing today. But Jesus came to heal. Matthew 20, I'm sorry, Matthew 4, verse 23 and 24. This is a great verse. If you marking down some of the verses, this is one you might want to mark down. A great verse that summarizes the ministry of Jesus here early in Matthew. Right after Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 4, he goes in the wilderness, he's tempted, baptized, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, and Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And that's encouraging. That means all kinds. Among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. There was no case that was brought to Jesus he was unable to deal with. Uh, Christ is the great physician. He is a healer. Now, I tell you, I like this verse in particular because it says that Jesus went teaching, preaching, healing. It says he went to the country, he went to the city, he went to the fields, he went to the church. It really encompasses all the different facets of Jesus' ministry in one verse. It's a tremendous verse. By the way, uh, the Bible says, as God the Father sent His Son, Christ said, even so send I you. So when we talk about the healing of Christ, uh, we should be involved in praying for people's healing as well. John, I'm sorry, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So how important is our physical prosperity to the Lord? He said, it's as important as your spiritual prosperity. God does care and he does want us to be physically well. And so this is part of God's plan for you. He wants us to be healthy. Now you might be saying, uh, everybody? Well, let's just think about it for a minute. Are you aware that if you live long enough, if you don't have an accident, you'll get sick and die? Uh, every healing that occurred in the Bible was temporary. Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, but where is he today? And so any biblical healing is really a lengthening of our tranquility so that we can experience the ultimate healing is going to be the new bodies and the new earth. Amen? Now, before I go any farther with healing, maybe it'd be good to have a definition, and I think they'll put this up on the screen for you. What does heal mean? To heal means the process of making or becoming sound or healthy again. 
to make free from injury or disease, to make whole as if you heal a wound, to restore to health. Now, why does Jesus heal? Why was so much of Christ's ministry involved in healing? I've not done the count myself, but I've heard more than one pastor say that as you go through the Bible, Jesus spends as much time healing as he does preaching. Because we experience everything in our bodies, and if our bodies are sick, it's hard for us to concentrate on the teaching part of things. So having people sound of body was very important to Jesus. But why does Jesus heal? Matthew 9, verse 4, there's a story. Matter of fact, I want to read this to you. And, And you'll find this story, it's in several places. You also find it in the book of Mark, um, chapter 2. But I'm going to read Matthew 9. I'll just start with verse 1. So Jesus got in a boat, and he crossed over, and he came to his own city. And behold, they brought him a paralytic, his own city being he stayed up around Galilee in, in Cana with, uh, where, or Capernaum, where Peter's family was. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. This is the one that was carried by four friends. And when they couldn't get in the house, remember, they took him up on the roof and they lowered him down. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, it must be awful to be paralyzed. I'd like to help you with that. Is that what he said? What did he say? Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Now, anybody in that room that day would have thought these men carried their friend all that distance for the single purpose of healing him of his paralysis because we just read The fame of Jesus went everywhere that he could heal. But why did he heal? The most important reason I believe Jesus healed people is so that he could get their attention to address a healing that would last forever. Any physical healing that you might have, and I hope some will experience that today, is really temporary. The healing God wants you to have is the one that is going to last eternally. But the temporary healing helps us to serve him and others in preparation for the eternal healing. First thing he said to this man was, son, your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. Who can forgive sin but God alone? Jesus knowing their thoughts. By the way, that's some proof that Jesus is God. God only knows people's thoughts. He said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For what's easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, arise and walk. Now, this is a part I've got to underline. If you underline, you may want to underline it. Why does he heal? But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin, to heal your spirit. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and he departed. The multitude saw it. They were amazed. Why did he do it? That you might know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sin. That's why he healed. And so the most important thing the Lord wants us to experience is eternal healing. And so all of the temporary healing, he wants us to have abundant life. He wants to heal. He still heals physically. I believe that. But the main thing is he wants us to experience that. So we say, he is a healer and he can heal me spiritually. And that's the one that lasts forever. Matthew 11 verse 3 Jesus said to them, go tell John. Remember, John the Baptist was in prison, and he kept waiting for Jesus to do something Messiah-like, proclaim himself king and, and uh, sit on the throne of David and overthrow the Romans. And John had these uh, very popular views of the day that the Messiah was going to come in his kingly power the first time, when in reality, the Messiah was going to come like a lion the second time. First time he came like a lamb. And so John was a little confused. And he he sent messengers to Jesus and said, are you the one we're looking for or do we wait for another? And Jesus ignored their question and they were waiting for him to respond. And while they're waiting, he is healing. He's restoring the eyes to the blind. He's cleansing lepers. He's helping the lame to walk. He's opening the tongue of the dumb. He's doing all these things while they're standing there waiting for their answer. Then he turns back and he said, Go tell John the things that you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, 
and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Notice he mentions all this physical healing, but he summarizes it by saying, and I preach the gospel to them. He got a crowd because everybody thought the most important thing is physical healing. Now, you know what's sad is some people want the physical healing, but they don't appreciate the, the spiritual healing. They're really saying, Lord, help me to feel better so I can enjoy sin better. Come on, fess up. Some of us only feel a little bad about being bad, but we feel real bad about feeling bad. And we wish the Lord would heal us because how can we enjoy our sin when we're sick? And God is merciful. You know, the Lord has wired us all so that our bodies have a certain amount of just natural healing ability. And it's great when you're young because it's, you know, you cut your knee and you think the world is ending and you see blood on your knee and you think, what will I do? I'm leaking now. And you, you think you're going to die and your grandma cleans it off and you get a kiss and next day it's gone. And <laughs> when you're young, it, it's amazing, the healing process. As you get older, it seems like it slows down a little bit. And it takes a little longer to get up from those scrapes and those wounds. But God's designed our bodies where they have an incredible ability to heal. So we praise Him for that. That's a miracle in itself. Matter of fact, scientists don't completely understand why people grow old and die. Because the body does have a, a very powerful restoring mechanism. Why does it stop? Why does it slow? They haven't figured that out yet. Now, there's seven reasons that we get sick. And they're going to put this up on the screen. And um, uh, by the way, Pastor Doug doesn't copy these online. I made that up and I made it where they're all beginning with the word A. I thought that was very creative. <laughs> First of all, you get sick because of your ancestors. If you don't want to get sick, choose your ancestors very carefully. <laughs> One of the very important things is that we often inherit certain genetic weaknesses. As a matter of fact, there are certain races that are predisposed to certain diseases. And uh, often when you want to figure out your longevity, they'll ask you, how long did your ancestors live? And that will have some effect. So some people, they, they inherit things from their ancestors. Your actions. We also get sick because of choices we make. The food you eat, do you exercise, you get enough water, air, sunlight. And so your actions will affect your sickness. Accident. Some people are sick because of an injury. And sometimes you injure one part of your body or one organ, it seems to have a chain reaction. And you can just experience all kinds of sickness connected with injury. An accident. Or attitudes. Some people are sick not because of what they eat, but because of what's eating them. And uh, the Bible talks about a broken spirit dries the bones. Some people are sick because of the mental stress. Uh, some are sick because of unforgiveness and bitterness. And they can't stop thinking about somebody that did them wrong and it just eats away at their health. Others acquire. You can catch a sickness, an infection from somebody else. Or you touch it and pick it up somewhere. Some people acquire it. And then you can get sick because I put angelic there. That doesn't sound as bad as it is, but I didn't say which angel. Uh, but the devil makes people sick. You can read where Jesus healed a woman who had bent over for years, and he says, Satan has bound this woman. The Bible tells us in the book of Job, the devil went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with boils. And so the devil often brings sickness, and Jesus said that. So that would be the angelic. And then finally, aging. Um, like I said, if you live long enough... I mean, you know, the ideal would be to do what Moses did. It doesn't always happen that way. The Bible says Moses lived 120 years. He climbs a mountain. His natural force had not abated, nor had his eye dimmed, and he died. When I first became a pastor, I pastored in a small town, a church, a real Seventh-day Adventist that lived the health message. I mean, they ate right. They worked outdoors, sunlight, fresh air, and, and just it was interesting to how many of them just sort of like fell over in their gardens in their 90s. And uh, they just were healthy to the end. That's kind of how we want to go, right? It'd be nice to have 24 hours notice. 
Just make sure your, your will is updated. But otherwise, it, nobody, you know, problem, the reason that the medical industry in North America is virtually bankrupt is because of the bad living practices so many people spend 30 years dying. And because they just, they start to die early because of, you know, a lot of bad choices that are made. But these are the reasons people get sick. Uh, now I'm going to give you another list that I think is even more important, and it's six. These are the six Bible principles to receive healing in connection with prayer. I'm going to share what they are, then I'm going to go through and prove my points. I couldn't get these to match with the same letter. <laughs> but I'm working on it. If you have a way to do it, you let me know later. So you've got repent, uh, ask for forgiveness for your sin, and be willing to forgive others. Ask, believe, cooperate with the practical laws of health and healing. Persist, do the above, rinse and repeat, so to speak. Just don't give up quickly. Many people were healed because they persisted. And that would be persist and accept. So let's start with repent. One of the important keys to receiving healing. Uh, I read to you a moment ago that when the Lord healed that man who had been let down through the roof, he said, your sins are forgiven. The first thing that was on God's mind was repentance and uh, forgiveness of sin. Um, if you can choose between having only one or the other, physical healing or spiritual healing, what would you want? Well, I'd want the physical healing until the day before I died, then I'd want the spiritual healing, right? No. Most important is the spiritual healing, the one that's going to last forever. But notice it's connected, even physical healing is connected with forgiveness. We've often read 2 Chronicles 7, 14, a good verse, verse to remember. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, what does repentance mean? A sorrow for sin and a willingness to turn away. Some people think that repentance is just you confess so you can carry on. Real repentance is a confession and a turning away from sin. If they will turn from their wicked ways, notice God says, if they, then I. That's a conditional promise, isn't it? He says, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Healing their farms and their families and their bodies and their nation. But the healing starts with the repentance. You notice also in James chapter 5, we read during our scripture reading, the prayer of faith, this is verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and if they've committed sins, he will be forgiven. And by the way, while we're reading that, this is the verse where it says if you're sick, you call for the elders and you pray over them and you anoint them with oil. Um, that verse there, when a person is sick, is referring to a serious sickness because it says they are so sick that they're so weak they can't get up and the prayer of faith will raise them up. So every now and then, we'll, as pastors, you'll get a call from someone. They say, Pastor, can I have an anointing service? We say, okay, what's the problem? Uh, this tooth this is really bothering me. I said, well, can I pray for you over the phone? Do, I, do we need to call the elders together? That's really not what that's for. Pastor, I got a headache. I had one sister came to me and she said, Pastor, I think I'd like to ask you to pull together the, the other elders and we're going to have an anointing. And I said, well, sister, tell me what, what the trouble is. She said, I'm just losing my hearing. And I can't hear and it's really beginning to bother me. It seems like it's, it's, it's just starting to progress rather quickly. I said, Sister Phillips, do you think there's a connection between your hearing and being 93 years of age? <laughs> and she smiled. She said, are you trying to tell me I'm getting old? <laughs> so I, I said, if you want us to, we'll have an anointing service. But I just want, I want you to know that at some point you might lose your hearing if you live long enough. And so those aren't the reasons typically for the anointing. It's someone who's stricken. But James, notice what he says, and if they've committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So it's in connection with forgiveness for sin. Obviously, um, Jesus made a priority out of that. Often when he healed a person, he said, go and sin no more 
lest the worst thing come upon you. Right? Then you ask. I wasn't sure whether to put repent or ask first or second because I, I think that you can ask before you repent for healing. The Lord may then convict you to repent, but he wants both. You got to start with asking. Now, I was looking at the Gospel of Matthew, and just in Matthew 8 and 9, you'll notice there's several examples of stories of healing that are there. We're going to look at three that are in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, three different examples of healing. In Matthew 8 chapter, and so Matthew 8 verse 2, it says, Behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He comes to Jesus. The Bible says in Luke, he's full of leprosy. And Jesus puts out his hand and he touches him. He says, I am willing, be cleansed. The ways that Jesus healed are many. Um, don't get into a rut of thinking God can only heal one way. Because in the Bible, Jesus healed by speaking. He healed remotely. He healed by touching. Um, he healed, the Bible says in one case, Peter healed someone by a handkerchief was taken from Peter to people. Some people were healed by the shadow of Peter. And so there's all the, now I'm not, I'm not recommending, no, there's some televangelists that send out hankies that are blessed for a price. I'm not recommending we go down that road. And Karen and I were watching some religious programming last night, and they were offering this uh, package where you could get your hallelujah healing oil. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you got to be careful. You start thinking God is going to heal with relics and, and things like that. But... Uh, he said, I am willing, be cleansed. So this man said, Lord, if you're willing, you could heal me. Jesus said, well, I'm not willing. Jesus said, what? I am willing. You know, the Bible says God is not willing that anyone should perish. And Jesus spent a lot of time healing people. And I think because sometimes God says no to physical healing or immediate physical healing, we're afraid to believe and ask. But more times than not in the Bible, Jesus did heal those who came and asked. I wonder how many have not been healed because they didn't ask and believe that he would. So ask. He said, I am willing. And uh, you can also read in uh, the story in Matthew 8, verse 5. It's the next story. The centurion. Now the first man is a leper. He's asking for himself. The second story is a centurion asking in behalf of someone else. So this message is relevant for everybody today. I won't ask you to raise your hands if you're sick. It might scare you if you see how many around you are sick. But how many of you know somebody that's sick? Aren't we supposed to be praying and interceding for others? You might have loved ones or friends. We have some members here. Praise the Lord. I see Pastor John is here today. He's sitting in the back to make a quick exit, but I see him back there. And we've been praying for him, had surgery, and praise the Lord, he's here today. Um, so we want to be praying for others. This centurion, he comes to Jesus. And he's praying for his servant that is sick. First he sends a messenger and he finds out Jesus is coming in person. He goes in person. He says, you don't need to come. I just meant for you to speak the word. I'm a man. I have soldiers underneath me. I say to one, go. He goes, come. The other one comes. says, they obey what I say. You speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus stopped in his tracks and he looks around. He says, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. It was a Gentile, a Roman. He's not even a church member, which brings another point. Does God only miraculously heal you once you're on the church books? Or does God send the sunshine and the rain on everybody? God is merciful. And there's, I've seen miracles of healing that many have experienced. And so um, Jesus said, I've not seen this faith. He said, be it unto you according to your faith. And his servant was healed. He wasn't a member. Neither was his servant as far as we know. But he came interceding in the behalf of someone else. He asked. So it begins with asking. Then you go to the end of that chapter, Matthew 8, verse 14. Jesus, at the end of the day, he comes to the home where he's staying, the home of Simon Peter. And Peter says, you know, my mother's wife is sick. And Jesus said, we can fix that. And it says, he touched her hand, and the fever left her. Again, you see the touch happening here. And she arose and served him. Now, Jesus was staying in this house. And I don't know, I didn't want to rush past this story without bringing out what I think is a good point. If Jesus abides in your home, 
And it says she got up. As soon as she was healed, she did what? She served him. Why does God heal us? To serve him. And if you're willing to serve him, he's more inclined to heal you. Because he can't afford to have his staff down. So if you're a willing servant, and if he abides in your house, he said, look, I'm staying here. I can't have her sick. Does he live in your house? Do you serve him? He touched her, and she immediately, and she probably wasn't a spring chicken. This is his mother-in-law. And so God not only heals the young, he heals the old, doesn't he? Then the other very important element in healing, and people kind of struggle with this point, is belief. Let me give you a few verses. Go to Matthew 9, 27. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And he said, Do you believe I am able to do this? They said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. You know, I don't know anywhere in the Bible where Jesus healed someone and he said, according to my faith. Sometimes I think it'd be easier if we could say, Lord, we believe you have faith. Can you heal me with your faith? He said, according to your faith. Father brought his son to Jesus and said, my son is afflicted with a demon. He throws him in the fire and throws him in the water. And, and I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't cast him out. And if you can do anything, you know how Jesus responded? He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. How important. In other words, he said, look, we can't, we can't move forward if you're talking if. Don't forget this. When Jesus was on the cross, there were two thieves, and they both talked to Jesus. Only one was saved. One said, if you're the Messiah, save yourself and us. He said, save us, but he said, if. The other one said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the one who said, if, will not be in the kingdom. So when you come to Jesus, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Whoever comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know what that father did, though, when he said, look, if you believe all things are possible, he realized that he had some doubts, and he said, Lord, can you heal my unbelief? He said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. So even if your faith is weak, you can pray that God will help your faith. So nobody here can walk away and say, I had no, I had no solution. Yes, you do. You can say, Lord, I struggle with faith. Heal my faith. And I think you can heal that prayer. You can answer that prayer. You must believe. And um, Mark 9 this is the father who was brought to him. He said, Lord, if you can heal him, cast him out. And Jesus then spoke, and this is verse 25. He saw people running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit. This is after the father said, help my unbelief. And he said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And faith is a crucial element in healing. Some of you remember the story where Jesus goes to the house of Jairus, sometimes pronounced Jairus, and uh, his daughter is sick. When Jesus first begins his journey, he said, my daughter is sick at the point of death. Come lay your hand on her and she will live. Jesus begins to go, but he gets stopped along the way by all these people that are wanting a word or to touch him. And along the way, this one woman reaches through the crowd, gets a hold of his garment, and she's healed. And right after he heals the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years, messengers come from Jairus' house and, and they say, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter died. Jesus saw the father's countenance sink, and he said, don't stop believing. Believe. Only believe. They get to the house. They've already started a funeral. Jesus says, don't make such a, a wailing noise. The girl is just sleeping. And he mocked him. He kicked them all out because they didn't believe. And he only brought with him Peter, James, and John and the parents because he didn't want anybody in the room that did not believe. You know, when Peter rose Dorcas, he kicked everyone out. Didn't want anywhere in there that didn't believe. When Elijah rose a boy to dead from uh, the dead, when Elisha rose a boy from the dead, they both kicked everyone out. They went in alone. God wants you to have faith. 
All things are possible. Is that still true or was that just back then? Anything is possible with God. And uh, took the girl by the hand, said Talitha Kumai, and raised her up. And then he did something practical. He said, give her something to eat if she was hungry. So belief is a crucial element in prayer. Now, when I talk about faith in God, um, there's one little story I want to draw your attention to about a father that had conditional faith. He said, if you heal my son, then I'll believe. He, he came to the Lord and he was going to ask for him to heal his son. This is, by the way, in John 4, 48. And he thought to himself, you know, if he heals my son, then I'll believe. And Jesus said, he knew his heart, he said, unless you see people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And when the father heard that, he realized the Lord read his heart. He fell down. He said, Lord, come down ere my son dies. He was desperate. Don't come to Jesus and say, well, I'll tell you what, if you heal me, then I'll serve you. If you don't heal me, I know one guy turned away from God. He says, I prayed that God would heal my brother who was dying from cancer, and he didn't, and he turned his back on God. Have you heard those stories? That's a conditional faith. You need the kind of faith where Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I had one brother who was struggling with cancer, a friend, and, and he prayed and prayed, and he's still sick. He said, Doug, you know, I've got peace. He was an older gentleman, and, and he said, I read where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar, our God who we serve is able to deliver us, but be it known that even if he doesn't deliver us, I'm not going to serve your idol. So the determination to trust God, regardless of whether you get what you want, that's what a real servant is. If you're only in it for the loaves and the fishes, it's the wrong attitude. So you need an unconditional faith. Then the next part is very important. Cooperate. Uh, God may heal through medicine. So when you're praying for healing, uh, how many of you have known of people who are praying for healing and they wouldn't use the practical medical needs available that had pretty good results? I'm sorry to tell you that I know people that are not with us today and I'm quite certain that if they had used proven medical methods, um, they'd still be alive. But they said, I'm just going to pray and put charcoal on it. You know? God is the one who gives some of these doctors skill and wisdom. Let me give you some verses. John 5.14, Jesus... Uh, actually, you know, I want to read to you Matthew 9.12. When Jesus heard that, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Well, you know, that might sound like an inverse, but if you read it another way, it could say, those who are sick need a physician. Those are the words of Jesus. So he said there's a reason for that. And boy, physicians back in Christ, they were not near as good as they are today. They must be at least 1% better today. I'm just teasing. Medicine's come a long way. John 5.14. Cooperate with God. Don't go back to the things that made you sick. If you pray for healing, if you're sick, you got high blood pressure and you're still eating a dozen donuts a day and you're praying for healing. I've had people come to me before and they, they're praying, they're dragging an oxygen bottle and they said, I've got emphysema, can you please pray for my emphysema? And I'll say, yeah, brother, but what about the cigarettes? Well, you know, God will heal me. He knows I love him. I said, come on now. They cooperate, <laughs> right? So if you're going to Use the medical means. Here's an example in the Bible. God said he was going to heal Hezekiah. Hezekiah was dying of some fever brought on by an infection from a boil, evidently. And Isaiah 38, God said, I'm going to heal you. It's going to take three days, but I'm going to heal you. He said, let them take a lump or a plaster of figs and apply it as a poultice to the boil and he will recover. Now these, this was a prescription from God for healing. By the way, they know now that, you know, honey... Yeah, it kills infection often, and I won't go into that right now, but yeah. Ezekiel 47, speaking of the trees in the ideal world, it says, their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Now, is God against medicine? And you even read that in Revelation. It says, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. 
I know you're going to ask me, are people going to get sick in heaven? No. That's an, another question, another program. But uh, I just want you to notice that he said, the leaves of the tree will be for medicine and their fruit will be for food. So, you know, God understands that there are things that are medicine. Someone said there are 50,000 different medicines that are derived from plants or trees. You ever have aspirin? Originally aspirin came from the bark of the uh, willow. And so if God has provided some medicine, oh, praise God for antibiotics. You ever go overseas and you catch a case of E. pluribus unum? And uh, if you've got some antibiotics, just praise the Lord. <laughs> they say one of the greatest inventions of the... Um, the last century was penicillin. They believe it saved millions of lives. I think it was God who inspired. Was it Fleming who discovered that? And so uh, you cooperate with the natural methods that God has given. Notice Exodus 15, 26. God said through Moses, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in His sight and give ear to the commandments and keep His statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you that I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord. Well, part of his commandments was, does God have things in his word about don't eat this, don't drink that, don't smoke this. It actually doesn't say that, but you know. And then he tells us, do stay clean. In other words, he gives us commandments that if you cooperate with the natural agencies that God outlines in his word, it will help accelerate and facilitate your healing. I remember hearing a story one time about a uh, church midweek. Choir was practicing on a Wednesday night and an old man came in the back door and he was bent over and laboring very slowly in pain, just bent about halfway over, made his way tapping with his cane back to the pastor's office. And a few minutes later, he came out and he was standing erect and he was walking quickly. And the choir conductor said, Brother, that's amazing. Did you just experience a miraculous healing from the pastor? He said, No, I found out my cane was about a foot too short. <laughs> Sometimes it's just something practical. And then whatever you do, don't quit quickly. Persist. Mark chapter 2. When they could not come near him because of the crowd, when Jesus healed the man that was let down through the roof, when they could not come near because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. They would not give up. They couldn't get through the door. They said, oh, we're just going to go home. No. Then they tried the window. We can't get them through the window. No. They went for the back door. It was blocked. They said, let's go to the roof. They continued to persist. The, that story would not be in the Bible if his friends had given up easy. You may have others you're praying for. You may be praying for yourself. You're wondering why the answer is slow in coming. That's God's problem. You keep praying. Do the other things that we're itemizing here. Mark chapter 10. There is, uh, Jesus was going through Jericho and the crowd was making a lot of noise and a blind man on the side of the road named Bartimaeus asked, what, what's the commotion? They said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you know, when you can't see, your hearing improves. And Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus. He had heard that he'd healed the blind before. And not knowing any other way to get Jesus' attention, he started to call out and he shouted, Son of David, have mercy on me. That was often how the sick approached Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. By the way, that's a title for the Messiah. And the Bible says Jesus did not answer him right away. Many in the crowd warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Persist. Crying out is praying, isn't it? Don't give up easy. How often did Elijah have to pray for the rain? And you know, while you're praying, they've got medical evidence that praying people heal better than those that don't pray. I'm not talking about hocus pocus studies. I'm talking about things like John Hopkins and some very serious studies have noticed that people who believe in prayer have a higher uh, percentage of healing than those who don't. Matter of fact, I, I wish I had it at my fingertips, but you've probably read it. There was a study that people who are prayed for, and if they don't even know they're being prayed for, 
show better results than those who are not prayed for. I believe prayer works. So pray, persistent prayer. Then point six, accept. Now, you accept your healing if he heals you, but also accept that it's temporary, and the most important thing is the eternal healing, right? Accept that healing. There are a couple of cases. Elisha was a prophet filled with a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and the Bible says that he got sick and died. Paul was an apostle who healed other people. He was filled with the Spirit of God. But listen to what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, Paul is saying, you know, lest I become proud because I've actually seen Jesus and I've had heavenly revelations and the Spirit of God has spoken through me, lest I become exalted, a thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. He's saying, I had a physical malady lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times, that's more evidence you should persist in prayer, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God's purpose in healing you forever might mean you need to be sick for a while here. And as I said, as you get older, you're going to have varying levels of aches and pains that are probably going to, you know, be more noticeable. Paul goes on, he says, Therefore most gladly, I'll rather boast in my infirmities. He said, I accept that. That the power of Christ might rest upon me. He said, if that's what it takes for the power of Christ to rest upon me, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. How do you know that your physical affliction, your sickness, might be a God's way of saving you? It might be the thing that he needs to get your attention or might be able to minister to others through you because you bear it patiently. Anything you go through, here's a simple law of life, anything you go through, any trial you go through is doing one of two things. God's either using it to reach you or he's using it to reach others through you or both. And so whenever you're going through a struggle, you might say, well, Lord, I uh, what do you want me to learn from this? Or how do you want to reach me or others through this trial? But I believe in biblical healing. Uh, we have people here in our midst that have experienced biblical healing. Matter of fact, I, we got anybody at the sound booth? Can you turn on a microphone for me? Is that one on? I don't want it to mix up with my mic, so I've got to do this separately. I just want to show you. I, as a pastor, you get a perspective. Not everybody has. Is it on? It's on. Can we turn this mic on? Do we have a test? Test. Is that on? Sort of. Okay. There we go. I just I see Bill right here in front of me. I don't want to embarrass him. Just a little bit, maybe. <laughs> Were you sick a little while ago, Bill? Yes. You were at the hospital and you were having problems breathing yeah. and you couldn't breathe. And your church was praying for you. Amen. And you're here today. Amen. Uh, do, you, do you believe in prayer? Amen. Just look at him. He's as mean as ever. And he's here, you're here today. God's blessing. I know. I told Vanya I was going to call her. I don't want to embarrass her. But this young mother over here, you, tell me your diagnosis. I know you don't have time for the whole testimony. What, what did the doctors tell you you had? I had a neuroendocrine pancreatic tumor spread metastatic to my liver. Now, the reason she said that so easily, she's a nurse. <laughs> but her health was very frail. Her family's here. You can ask. Uh, it looked very serious. They, they didn't think that uh, you had much chance of recovery from that, did you? Matter of fact, you thought you were going to die each day just from the blood sugar swings. Is that right? And... Vanya came and asked the pastors to pray and do an anointing. Now, how long ago was that? Four years. And what are the doctors telling you now? Are you having to go every day and see the doctor? Uh, my oncologist uh, discharged me for, from her caseload, and uh, uh, pretty much the doctor told me they don't know what to think about it, and just wait and see. 
And so for four years, she'd been feeling fine. Isn't that wonderful, friends? We have another sister. I don't know if I see Joy today. Let me, I'll tell you her story real quick. Is, um, Sister Joy was in the hospital. She had what everyone thought was a massive stroke and uh, went to visit. Respirator, in a coma. Family's there in the hospital bed, all the machines hooked up. And um, family's getting ready to argue over the stamp collection. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but I mean, it just didn't look very good. And then I, before I left, he said, Pastor, can you pray? And so, sure, I'll pray. You know, I prayed for the comfort, and I prayed for the family. And then I thought, well, if I'm a good pastor, if I really believe, I ought to say, and Lord, we know that if you want, you can heal joy. But I just got to tell you, in my heart, I thought, I'm just saying that to make the family feel better. Because, you know, where, where there's hope, there's life. So I just thought, we'll hold out hope. And so I said, and if you want, you can heal joy. So I said goodbye. And the next day, I got a phone call. I thought, for sure, they're letting me know this is it. We need to make arrangements. And they said, did you hear? Mom sat up in bed, and they took out a respirator. And she said, she's hungry. What am I doing here? It's been like six years ago. And she's 85 now. And so, oh, I see one more I forgot about. Sue. You don't mind my Sue Schultz here. And Walt, you were, in, you were on dialysis? Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, Walt couldn't wake me up one day, and he had to call the ambulance. They took me to the hospital. My kidneys had shut down. And uh, they, they put me on dialysis, and, and then Walt uh, asked people at uh, Bible study to pray for me. And um, I believe that... Um, through the prayer, I was able to get through 2018. I've had to wipe that whole year out because I was ill. I'm still recovering. Yeah, but, but your heart was failing, but you were here. In, first, you were in a hospital bed, then you were on a walker, and now you're walking on your own. Yes, a kidney doctor came walking in and said, you're a miracle. We all thought you were dying, and look at you. You're up walking, no wheelchair, no walker, anything. And uh, I says, well, praise God for that. That's a prayers of God's people. Can you say amen? amen? I'll tell you one more story. I'm going to ask the studio to put a picture on the screen. Some of you remember uh, about a month ago, we started to pray for a young man named Xander. And uh, a lot of people were praying. We put it on Facebook. Um, Father works for Amazing Facts. They're often here. Um, uh, Karen and I went to see him, and he was about as close to death as any human I've ever seen. That poor boy, he got a, an infection, he's seven years old, and every organ in his body just began to shut down. Heart, lungs, kidneys. And the, in this one photograph, um, he's on a heart machine that's pumping his blood. He's on a respirator. He's on kidney dialysis. They're afraid that um, a thousand complications that might have to amputate his toes, brain image, or brain damage, and just all kinds of problems. But we put that up and we asked for people to pray. And how many of you remember? We were praying in our church, and he's been there for a month. I'll show you the next picture. That's Xander now with a friend from school, and he's expected to make a full recovery. Can you, man? I believe in prayer. I believe God answers prayer. And, you know, I, I want to remind you, just in closing, that Jesus, principally, he wants to heal our hearts. Now, Jesus healed hands. Did you know that? Someone had a crunched up hand. He healed it because God wants to heal your works. Jesus healed feet because God wants to heal your walk. Jesus healed eyes because God wants you to see with vision where you're going. Jesus healed tongues because he wants us to speak his words. Jesus healed backs because he wants us to stand for him. I mean, you name it, Jesus could heal it. It says he healed all manners of affliction. But you know the most important thing the Bible says, you read in Luke 4.18, Christ said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor 
He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus heals hearts. Maybe your heart has been broken. And maybe you've been hurt. And maybe your heart has been broken uh, with just your own sins or whatever it might be. Whatever it is, you have no problem that Jesus doesn't have the answer for. Amen? Amen? I believe that, friends. The Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. Because Jesus died for us. We can be healed from anything. I love this verse, Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Heal, save. That's what he wants. He especially wants the eternal healing.